This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. This is the second lecture on discounted gas flow techniques. And I did say at the end of the last lecture, when we'd worked out the net present value, for example, one, uh, I did say to keep hold of the figures because um, we're going to do something else on it. Uh, if you look at the next bit uh, of the lecture notes, um, it talks about the internal rate of return. Now, I've already checked you on internal rate of return. And I've revised it with you when we looked at um, cost of redeemable debt. Uh, but equally, uh, you could be asked to work out the internal rate of return for a project. It's unlikely, to be honest, in this exam. It's rarely asked. But I need to check it with you because something new that can be asked is what we call the modified internal rate of return. So, before I explain what that is and why, let's first of all do example two, which says for the project in example one, calculate the internal rate of return. Uh, and if you remember from uh, my earlier lectures on the cost of debt, uh, for the internal rate of return, we make two guesses and we approximate. So we've already discounted at ten percent. Let's now, and no, no, sorry, it was positive. Well, for the internal rate of return, it's the rate of interest which gives the net present value of zero. So, given that it's positive at ten percent, to get zero, the rate of interest must be higher. Let's discount at a higher rate, make a second guess, and then we can approximate to the IRR. Um, now, the flows are obviously the same, so let me get rid of all this. Forgive me to leave space. It's much better than using a blackboard and rubbing out chalk. Anyway. Sorry, nearly there. There, now plenty of space. Uh, it's the same project, so we'll take the same cash flows. Not one, two, three, four, five. The cash flows were two thousand four one three four one one four one seven four three one fifteen zero eight. Uh, but as I say, we've already discounted at one rate at 10%. And so, make a second guess, we'll discount at a higher rate. And guess anything you like, use any rate you like, uh, I'll use 18%. I'd probably actually use either 15 or 20, but I'll use 18%. And if we discount at 18%, Discount factors for one year, 0.847, for two years, 0 0.718, 0 0.609, 0 0.516, 0 0.437. And so the present values, 2,000, uh, 413 times 0.847, is 350. 411 times 0 0.718, 295. 417, 0 0.609 is 254. 431, 0 0.516, 223. And finally, 1508 times 0 0.437 is 659. So what's the net present value at 18%? 350, 295, 254, 223, 659, and minus 2,000. Um, it's minus uh, 219,000. So we've got our two guesses, but it's positive at it's negative at 18. To get zero, the internal rate of return must be, 
between the two, well, again, I shouldn't need to waste time. If you're still unsure about IRRs, uh, look back again at the lecture on redeemable debentures. Uh, but here, well, just let me get them in front of me. 10% was plus, what was it? 258. 18% was minus 219. So over a change of eight percentages, the net present value fell from 258 positive to 219 negative. The total fall four seven seven, which means the internal rate of return. Start with our first guess of 10%. We know it's higher than 10%. To get zero, we need a fall of 258. We know 477 is eight percentages. So it's this fraction, 258 over 477 times 8%, which gives me 1.5. I get 14.33%. Uh, now, I've already said uh, in the earlier lecture, but I will repeat, uh, the two things here. One is, this is only ever approximate, and do actually make that point, uh, because we are effectively assuming linearity that... As the cost of capital increases, the net present value falls. We assume it falls linearly, which in practice it doesn't. It's a curve. So all we can really say is it's about 14%. Uh, and I also said that because of that, if you make different guesses, you will get a slightly different answer. And that's not a problem. It'll still be somewhere around 14%, otherwise you've made a mistake. But I'm not going to check now. I think in my answers at the back of the lecture notes, I think I made the second guess at 20%. And you will see the answers are a little bit different, but it's still around 14%, and that's fine. However, I've already said that to be asked to work out the return rate of return for a project is, is very rare, to be honest, in this exam. You're very likely to need IRR, but it'll be in the calculation of the cost of debt. However, I needed to remind you here, to remind you of the problems that can be in using it, and therefore why, in this exam, there's mention of something called modified internal rate of return. And so first of all, the problem with IRR is this, that you see, if it's simply accept or reject, no problem. We worked out the MPV and we know it's positive, we accept. Uh, but if you wanted, but we don't do this in the exam, but you could have said, ah, we're borrowing at 10%, that's the cost of capital. It's in a effectively giving a return of 14%. Oh, well, 14 is giving us more than 10, fine, we accept, no problem. But where there could be a problem is if you were comparing two projects. If you were comparing two projects, and I said project A gave a return of 10%, and project B gave a return of 12%, and I said, which project would you prefer? I think you'd probably say, oh, I'd prefer Project A. Well, oh, shit, sorry, I'd have Project B. 12% is better than 10. But it's, there's a danger. Suppose, for instance, I said Project A lasted 15 years. Project B only lasts two years. Now then, which would you prefer? You know, if you could get 10% a year for 15 years, 
And suppose the cost of capital is only 5%. If you could get a 15, uh, sorry, 10% a year for 15 years, or alternatively, 12%, but only for two years, then I think you're quite likely to say, oh, well, I prefer uh, Project A, if that's the only alternative. You know, either both of them are giving far more than five. A, I'm happy to get slightly less per year because I'll get it for such a long time. Uh, whereas B, I get slightly more, but I only get slightly more for two years. You can't compare projects in the same way. Uh, what you'd have to do is work out the net present value of both. And whichever was the highest net present value would be the better. But you can't validly compare internal rates of return. You can't automatically say here, B is better. The only time you could say it was better is this. If we assume the receipts from both projects are reinvested at the IRR, Now, if we assume that, just think about it. Do project A, you get 10% for 15 years, but as the money comes in, if you could carry on investing the money again at 10%, then effectively you'd end up getting 10% forever. And similarly, project B, if we could assume that as the money came in, we could then invest it again in, you know, in another similar project and always be getting 12%. Then effectively, we'd be getting 12% forever. And then it would be valid to say B was better. No question, I mean, it would have the higher MPV as well. B would be better if you can get 12% a year forever instead of 10% a year forever. But only then could you compare the IRRs. Otherwise, it's not a valid comparison. Well, to get round that problem, uh, something appeared called the modified internal rate of return. Now, I actually think this is a bit of a cheat. I really do. But and perhaps that's why it's rarely asked, but it has been asked, and it's something new that wasn't in the earlier exam. Uh, but a way of getting around that problem, a way of calculating the internal rate of return in a different way, which means, even if it is 10 years, 2 years, 15 years, that comparing them would give us the right answer. And let's just do the arithmetic first, and then I'll basically explain what it's doing. But there is a formula, and you've given it on the formula sheet, and I've typed it out in the notes. The modified internal rate of return is PVR over PVI to the power 1 over N times 1 plus RE minus 1. So it's very much a calculator exercise, but as always, you uh, need to know what the symbols mean. And then it's just obviously operating a calculator. Well, as I've written down before, uh, below, PVR is the present value of the return phase, uh, whereas PVI, present value of the investment phase. Now, what those mean, if we look back, we're going to apply this to uh, example one again. Example one, when we got the cash flows, it involved an outflow, and the outflows at the beginning are the investment phase, and then it gave us inflows. This is the return phase. And so doing it on example one, the original example one, the
the investment phase was that 2000. There could have been investments and outflowing year one, uh, zero and time one, maybe the present value of the two. But here it's just the 2000 and the present value is 2000. As far as the return phase is concerned, that's the present value of all the later inflows. And so the present value of them, uh, 375 plus 339 plus 313 plus 294 plus 936 is 2257, which makes me wonder why I've got the net 258. Five, let me just check that. 375 plus 339 plus 313 plus 294 plus 936. 225 maybe else. Maybe I was a thousand out before, but I'm not worried. Uh, anyway, it comes to 2257. Uh, N is the life of the project. Well, this project was five years, so N is five. And our E is the cost of capital. Well, in our original question one, the cost of capital was 10%. 10% uh, or 0 0.1. It's now just sticking into the formula, but make sure you are clear what's happening. PVR over PVI is 2257 over 2000. It's to the power 1 over n, 1 over 5. <coughs> uh, now, before I write the rest of it down, you should know from school what that means, but it, that's the way it's typed on the formula sheet, and that's the way it tends to be typed in examiner's answers. But if something is to the power 1 over something, in this case 1 over 5, it's another way of writing the fifth root. So if it's to the power 1 over 2, it's the square root. If it's to the power 1 over 3, it's the third root. Here it's to the power 1 over 5, which is the fifth root. Uh, well, we multiply whatever we get from that by 1 plus RE, 10.1, so 1.1. And then, off the whole thing, we'll subtract 1. Well, I've said before, you must have a scientific calculator for this exam, clearly. Make sure you can press the buttons. Uh, but here, it's the fifth root... Uh, of 2257 divided by 2000 times 1.1 minus 1. I get 0.1269 or 12.69%. Uh, now, obviously, as I said, Different calculators, you have to put figures in in different orders. Uh, make sure you can get that. You don't be wasting time messing around in the middle of an exam. But arithmetically, there is the modified internal rate of return. Now, the relevance of it, as I said before, this really is a bit of a cheat. But Using this, then again, accept to reject. We didn't have a problem anyway. But we say, no, we're borrowing at 10%. We're getting a return this time of 12.69. Accept. It would always give us the right decision. But if it ever came to comparing two product products, if I gave you A and B and I said, this one's giving 12.69%, if the other one's giving... 13.2% as modified internal rate of return. Then, although the one with the highest MPV is always the best, here you can compare MIRRs, you could say that B was definitely the best. And this one 
has calculated it assuming uh, that inflows are reinvested oh dear, in both cases at the cost of capital. Which you could argue is more logical. You see, in my previous, when I was looking at ordinary term rates of return, I said you could only compare if you know receipts from A could be reinvested at IRR ten percent, receipts from B at IRR twelve percent. That's really rather unlikely. You know, why should? It's because there are two projects now. Why should you always be able to invest at twelve or always be able to invest at ten? Uh, with MIRR, it's perhaps more logical in that since money's costing you 10%, you could effectively always reinvest at 10% because you could use the money to repay borrowing and save at 10%. However, uh, I've said more than enough there. I've already said I think it's a little bit silly, quite frankly. And perhaps that's why it's not asked very often, but it could be. Uh, and it's easy enough. Uh, you're given the formula, just then say remember what the symbols mean and make sure you could use your calculator. All right, we're getting closer. I'll leave that lecture there. In the next lecture, uh, back to straight discounting, but I did say that the Example we looked at in the last lecture was really a basic example, like the previous financial management exam. Um, in this exam, he does throw in some extra complications. A very common complication um, is for a company to be setting up a new company, a subsidiary, whatever, in a foreign country, where all the basic rules remain the same, but there are a few extra things to consider. So in the next uh, lecture, I'll go through an example of foreign investment appraisal.